this time with the Honourable Member from Skeena Bogley Valley. Um, I share his passion for this topic. I share the passion with the Honourable Member who has tabled this motion for Nanaimo Cowichan and I wish to thank her on behalf of the First Nations who I'm in consultation with for bringing forward this matter to the House. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker, I stand in support of this motion, this motion that calls for greater action and improvement of economic uh, uh, outlooks for First Nations, Inwood and Métis, particularly in the coming budget, to commit action to treaty implementation and full and meaningful consultation. So the proof will be in the pudding, Mr. Speaker, when this next budget is tabled. We've heard lots of promises from across the floor, and I can assure you that not just the official opposition, or other opposition parties will be watching that document carefully, but so will all the Indigenous peoples of this country. On treaty implementation, well, I will get into that in a minute. Um, certainly the government has been falling down, even though some mechanisms were put in place to resolve specific claims, the actions by the government have in fact uh, not resolved the matter and made things worse. I wanted at the outset, Mr. Speaker, to reiterate the call by uh, my colleague, the MP for Timmins, James Bay. And he called for Parliament to step up and finally take serious action on the economic, social and moral deficit in respect for and taking action to lift our Aboriginal peoples from a century of discrimination and poverty. And I think it's very important, Mr. Speaker, that we reiterate that, that we not just talk about economic strategies and we talk about the implementation of trees, that we actually talk about the basic issue here of why it's critical to move forward on those matters. And secondly, he reminded us that we're all treaty people. If there's one thing, Mr. Speaker, that I have heard over and over again over the last year, and including when I had the honour of being the critic for Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development, and that is the reminder which has come from the Elders, it has come from the Chiefs and Council members, it's come from the Aboriginal youth, it's come from the National Chief, Sean Atlio, and that is the treaty was entered into by both sides. We have responsibilities under the treaty in the same way as the First Nations. We are treaty people. And third, concrete action is needed to restore a good faith relationship. And you've heard that over and over again today, Mr. Speaker. Well, this government, Mr. Speaker, likes to talk about the real issue is the economy. The economy, the economy, jobs, jobs, jobs. Real engagement in the economy. Well, Mr. Speaker, Engagement in the economy requires equitable access to education. How are you going to get a well-paying job unless you have access to advanced education? Or even to get through grammar school with a 35% graduation rate. As National Chief Sean Atlio has frequently pointed out, he's a great advocate for greater support to uh, Indigenous education. He said, we have a higher rate of incarcerating our Aboriginal youth than we do in graduating them from high school. So clearly, you can't get a job that's well-paying, contribute to the economy, unless you have equitable access. Safe living conditions. How are you going to study if your house or your school is full of mold and you don't have set steady supply of electricity or heat? Safe drinking water. Simple facts that we Canadians take for granted. Concentrated action to provide jobs to the hardest hit. We hear lots of examples, as my colleagues have pointed out, of the success cases. and. Uh, when I was a critic and I participated in the committee review of the exact uh, uh, initiatives, the, the changes to the land management regime, many of the First Nation leaders came in and said, look, it's not the same for all of us. We don't all have the fortune of, of uh, living or having a reserve immediately adjacent to a major industrial centre or a major municipality. It's very hard for the isolated communities. And what their particular concern was, frankly, with a, a fair benefit agreement on the traditional lands, not necessarily developing their reserve lands. I would like to point out, Mr. Speaker, that the Parliamentary Secretary pointed out Fort Mackay. Yes, Fort Mackay First Nation in northern Alberta, right in the centre of uh, the oil sands development, has, by necessity, forged agreements with uh, industry so that they can benefit, and they've had a number of contracts. But it's important to recognise that even Fort Mackay is drawing a line in the sand. The last of their important lands, which are for specifically designated for the traditional practices, are about to be hurt. They're about to be completely circled by oil sands development. They, like all the other First Nations that come forward, want not just a piece of the pie, not just a job, 
they want a say in the decision making about the resource development in their territories and in areas next door to their territories where they might be impacted. The uh, engagement process in the economy also means that they have to have equitable benefit agreements. And we've turned time after time where some isolated First Nations on their own are left to try to negotiate fair agreements with major uh, corporations. Some cases they do well, in other cases not. Where is the federal government's responsibility to ensure that they are supported in those endeavors? So what is, Mr. Speaker, the starting point for measuring progress? We hear all the time from this government about all the money they've spent. Any question that is asked, whether it's education, safe drinking water, the right to be consulted, the right to a job, look at all the money we've spent. So what is the starting point for measuring progress? Is, the date, is it the date of the signing of the treaties? Is it over 100 years back with the uh, historic and the number treaties? Is it the date of signing of the modern treaties? We've been hearing concerns ongoing in committee and in delegations meeting with members of parliament in concern with the failure of this government to live up to and implement the treaties. Is it the date of the addition of Section 35 to the Constitution? Is it the repeat calls by the Auditor General to take action on better protections for First Nations? And uh, in the last uh, uh, audit issued by then uh, Auditor General Sheila Fraser, she said very clearly, she singled out the conditions on First Nation reserves, said that the federal government had taken some action, but simply not enough. <coughs> In her words, Mr. Speaker, it's no secret that their living conditions, that's the First Nations, are worse than elsewhere in Canada. For example, only 41% of students on reserves graduate from high school, compared with 77% of students in the rest of the country. And more than half of the drinking water systems on reserves still pose a health threat. And has been pointed out, Mr. Speaker, still more than 100 oil water advisories in the 21st century. Sheila Fraser then said, what's truly shocking, however, is the lack of improvement Last year, Indian and Northern Affairs Canada reported that between 20, 2001 and 2006, there was little or no progress in the well-being of First Nation communities. In a wealthy country like Canada, the gap is simply unacceptable. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, my colleagues on the other side will say, yeah, 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 that was the Liberals. Well, it's important to note here that the success of two Auditor Generals after Sheila Fraser raised exactly the same issue so still not a lot of progress. Mr. Speaker, is it the date of the 2012 First Nation Crown Summit, where a lot of undertakings were take, made? Or the unanimous vote for the Shannon's Dream motion calling for equitable access to education? Is it the promised expedited settlement of languishing specific claims? Is it the recommendations of the National Panel on First Nation Education? So there are many points of juncture where we could begin measuring progress. Sadly, we're still not seeing a lot of substantive progress across the board. It's very important, Mr. Speaker, to point out that what First Nation peoples, Métis and Inuit are calling for are both substantive rights and procedural rights, both which are guaranteed in the Constitution and legislation. What is appalling is this continued reference, Mr. Speaker, by the, this government of the day of willing partners, willing First Nations. And the question has to be raised. We know fully their disregard for any First Nation resorts to the courts. They're being forced to resort to the courts because of their abject refusal to properly consult. And we have a number of actions filed just in the last month by First Nations in Northern Alberta and in Saskatchewan, lambasting the government for failure to consult on their own budget. The United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the First Nations see that as carrying that obligation even further that they should have the right to consent. Um, I would just, in closing, Mr. Speaker, like to share that I was profoundly impacted by the opportunity of participating in some of the Island No More gatherings. And I say gatherings. These were not protests. These were gatherings led by elders, including youth, including chiefs in regalia. And I had the opportunity to, along the way, talk to many youth who desperately want to participate in the economy desperately want to have their voice heard. I have been approached by uh, the treaty chiefs and councillors in my province, in Treaty 6, 7 and 8, asking for my advice on how they can get this government to open up the budget, 
to, re to reverse their decisions on undermining the environmental laws which protect their traditional lands. And in closing, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to the government supporting our motion, but more than that, actually moving to take action. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Mississauga South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, ask the member opposite about the, her opinion of some of the actions that the Harper government has taken to address the important and pressing issues. In particular, I'd like to ask the member if she would acknowledge that the government has made progress. Just uh, remind the Honourable Member uh, for Mississauga South that we uh, try to stay away from the mentioning of other Honourable Members' names in the course of our uh, remarks. The Honourable Member. Sorry, uh, that the actions of this government is that uh, the actions this government is taking. Uh, will she acknowledge uh, that the government has made progress on, on some of the following concrete uh, priorities in health, uh, education, economic development, and housing? For example, uh, since 2006, there have been 30 new schools built on reserves and 200 more renovated. Um, also, we've, this government has built over 10,000 new homes and renovated thousands more on reserves. Absolutely. We've increased funding for child and family services by 25 percent, introduced legislation ensuring that the Canadian Human Rights Act applies on reserves, and settled 80 outstanding land claims. I'd say these accomplishments are very impressive. Will the member opposite admit that this government is, is in fact very sensitive to the realities of Canada's First Nations communities? Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question put forward by the Honourable Member. It's not for me to respond. The, the individuals and the communities that they're accountable to are the First Nation, the Métis and the Inuit communities. We are simply standing and being a voice for the very peoples who are not being given a voice. It is those peoples who are taking to the streets, holding round dances, calling for, for meetings, asking how they can be, persuade this government to change their closed-door process and excluding them from consultation. It's not for, for me as an individual member. It's not for the colleagues on this side of the House. It is for the government to ask the First Nations, Inuit and Métis, have we done enough? Are we taking the right path? Questions and comments? <clears throat> Uh, Question and comment, the Honourable. Questions and comments. The Valley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and I wonder if my friend can help me understand the government's position today, because I'm again looking back at the actual motion we presented to the House, which the foundation of it is, is based on two things. One is to respect First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people and help them uh, develop uh, their economies. And the second one is to follow the law. Um, uh, yet we can't seem to be able to find a government member who says whether the government's going to vote against or with the motion. They've had all day with this thing. It's not very many words, and it says something that they seem to repeat in their speeches, but yet won't confirm. The, the reason I think this is important is that often the government says, you know, why do you know, First Nations people just simply trust us? You know, we, we, we've, we're doing the hard work and we're saying the nice things, and yet when you try to pin them down and say, well, yes or no, are you, are you good for this, are you good for that? They, they seem to have a struggle uttering those words, yes or no. And, and, and I'm wondering if this speaks to a deeper uh, culture within the government, uh, a deeper suspicion in this conversation, that, that First Nations seems to be treated with a very, very different brush than they approach industry with, than they approach crime and justice issues with, that First Nations has a different tone, a, a different angle from this government, and a, and a direct question rarely gets a direct answer. I'm wondering if she has any opinions or insights into that. to thank the Honourable Member for his question. One thing that I've mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker, that troubles me is almost a letter. Every single question that we have put to the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs in this House, the same response has come. And the, the uh, member across the way put the question to me seems to be leading to the same thing. It's all about money. And it's not all about money. That's what I, not what I'm being told by Indigenous Peoples of Canada. It's about respect. It's about obeying the law and the Constitution. And unfortunately, I don't have time. If I did, I would read out the letters that have been provided to me that were forwarded to the Prime Minister from the Treaty 6, 7, and 8 Chiefs and Councillors. 
and every one of them say the same thing. They feel they've been silenced by the parliamentary process. They're calling on the government to rescind the laws that were passed that impact their lands, waters, and peoples without due consultation, without adhering to the constitutional and legal obligations.